RCPA does have office hours for all the members of the staff. Uh, Adrian and myself will have office hours right after our lectures. So my office hours will be after class today. It will be after class on Wednesday. And then starting next week, actually, the order is going to swap. So Adrian will teach two lectures in a row to get you guys all up to speed on surface theory. So then his lectures will be on Mondays, and then mine will be on Wednesdays to kind of follow up on what he did with snow class. Yeah, you know, the, the practical standpoint. Also, uh, Diana, our course uh, assistant, has office hours on Mondays. Yeah, that's OK. Uh, Mondays from 1.15 to 3.15. And I think all three of us are going to hold our office hours in Clark S215. Uh, if you haven't been there before, it's pretty easy to find. Basically, it's right underneath us. Um, there's like a little meeting room with sink and, and stuff that, that overlooks the interior part of the Clark Center. It's got a big window. So if you can't find us, just walk around the, the second floor in the interior and just kind of stand in the window to turn the corner and you'll be able to find us. It's remotely possible. I'll hold my office hours in peace. Yeah, <laughs> me too. If, if, yeah, if I need my coffee in the morning and I haven't had it before class, then, then uh, yeah, we'll send an email to that effect. Or, or you know, just come hunting for us. This building isn't that big. Uh, if, and, and if you email us ahead of time, let us know you're coming, then we'll be sure to be there. Not that, that we wouldn't anyway. Um, your first homework is due a week from today. How many people have started? That's more than I would have expected. Uh, <laughs> you should start at this point. Uh, after today's lecture, you will have all the material you need to do the entire problem set. So, the, so and, and it is, if you, if you looked at it, you've probably seen that it that the, the problems actually are pretty short, but the notation is probably unfamiliar, the PS code. So you might get started a little sooner so that you can have that sudden realization that it's not so bad, rather than the last minute panic because it's, you know, it's typed in LaTeX and it looks kind of tricky. Um, are there any questions about procedurally, uh, how the class is going, uh, homework, project, anything else? Um, yeah, you know that you're, you're expected to sign up to be a scribe. I, I haven't gone down the course list and, and made sure there's a bisection between people on the list of scribes and people on the list of people taking the class. But be sure to sign up if you haven't already. Cool. All right. So I thought I'd begin today's lecture with a little bit of review from last Wednesday, from Adrian's talk, because we're going to make a lot of use of it today in the class. So if you recall, the big object that Adrian talked about uh, was something that's very familiar to our everyday lives, namely a curve. Right? And the way that we think about a curve initially a function gamma of z, right? Z is just some real number, and it takes, for example, the reason we use the letter t, at least in, in my brain, is that t stands for time, yeah? So basically what it says is that at time t, I'm marching along this curve and, and tracing out a path behind me, right? Um, but then the very first thing that we usually do in differential geometry is we define this thing called r squared, right? Otherwise known as distance. It's just how far I've traveled along this curve. We have this handy formula for r squared, where we take the derivative with respect to t, take its norm, and then integrate it. And this tells me, at a particular time t, how far I've traveled since time zero. Yeah? And then what we usually do is, instead of writing gamma as a function of time, we write gamma as a function of the distance that we've walked along the curve. Right? And usually, whenever we see the letter s, we're going to think of s as r squared. I honestly, I'm not sure why we use s, but it's next to t. Uh, and, and so basically, all we've done is said, we don't care. If I'm driving along the curve, and I hit the accelerator of my car, and I drive down the curve faster, that doesn't affect the shape of the curve that's traced out behind me. So I might as well just walk along the curve in some nice canonical way, namely like one meter per second. And that's the very first thing that we do, because that way we get rid of some of this dependence on t that we don't really care about. Does that make sense? And what happened after that? Uh, oh, yeah. And by the way, this, this object on the left-hand side that, that we, uh, the, this thing that we really care about analyzing rather than a function of t, it's called the trace of the curve, right? And, and one way that you can think of it is as a set of points, right? Namely, it's a set of points that is the image of t for each t, right? So every time I plug in a t, I get a different point in the tree space or the t space, depending on where I am, right? And, and, and this just traces out some set. So really, I care about the set, not the function. So then the very first thing that we did was we took this curve 
Thoughts means limited. Oh, okay. Even even there. As a synonym for, for fun. Yeah. So from now on, basically, you can never think of T again, as is perfectly fine. In that case, it doesn't matter. Anyway, if we take the first derivative with respect to our plane, we get this thing called the unit tangent vector. Right? We all know what a tangent is, right? It touches the curve, and makes straight lines. Uh, and it's automatically unit length if we parameterize our curve by arc length, right? And now we wrote down a proof for this on Monday, or I guess last Wednesday, but it's actually a very intuitive fact, right? Because what did I do when I parameterized this curve by arc length? Well, I got rid of pressing the accelerator of my car, right? So in that case, all my car is doing is driving at one meter per second, so the unit tangent has unit length. Yeah? Pretty reasonable. Then, uh, oh, before, before we move on, I thought I'd do a quick exercise because this is like the little mini theorem that just shows up repeatedly in the theory of curves, right? Um, Adrian, I think, applied this at least six times on Wednesday. But basically, let's, let's, uh, so let's do this little short exercise here. Suppose we have this function v, right? Take t, actually t can be time here, it doesn't matter. And it maps it to rn. And we have this one property of v, which is that it's unit, unit length for all time. And what we can show is that v and the derivative of v are orthogonal to one another. Yeah. So, so how did we do that on on uh, on Wednesday? Well, let's let's write it out real quick. I, I don't think it's, <coughs> think it's worth spending a whole lot of time. But the one way to write the norm of v squared, of course, is v inner product with itself. Yeah. So we know that this thing is equal to one because v is equal to one, and one squared. Is what is the derivative of 1 with respect to t? Well, it's 0, right? And so this is equal to the derivative with respect to t of v inner product with itself. Yeah? And by the uh, product rule, right, we get v prime inner product v plus v inner product v prime. And of course, you can swap the order any way you want. So we get that that is equal to 2 times v inner product v prime. And that pretty much gives us all the answers. I know it's the world's stupidest, smallest theorem. But literally, this is what we do to construct the Brene frame. They do all these different proofs. Um, I believe it shows up on your homework. And if it doesn't, you're probably using it accidentally or something. Um, and so let's see one application of that, which is the Brene frame. Right? So we drew a curve out in 3D space, right? this movie thing. We call it gamma of t. And now at each point of gamma, we can associate three orthogonal vectors. Now the very first vector that we associate this point is pretty clear, right? It's the unit tangent vector, and like we're super intuitive about what the unit tangent means, how to construct it, like 20 different ways. But then we can also construct these two other guys, right? We'll call them the normal and the binormal, right? And basically the way that we did that is we took the derivative of the unit tangent, right? And what do we know about the derivative of the unit tangent based on this whole thing we just proved here? Is that it's orthogonal to the tangent vector, yeah. So if we're trying to con construct a three frame, right, then, then we just got a, a thing that, that's, that's, that's perpendicular to t for free, right? And we're going to call that the normal after we've divided it by its length, right? And then what's another way to take a third orthogonal thing from t that we already have? You just take the cross product, and you get the binomial, right? And one sort of intuition that we talked about is that sort of the first order of the tangent is a pretty good approximation of your curve, right? It makes it look like a line. The second order, you can think of the tangent and the normal as sort of a plane that your curve sits in. And then the binormal is just, well, the third thing. <laughs> and, and, and we also have these two numbers that are associated, right? We have the, the curvature of your curve, right, which is going to be the, the length of the derivative of dt dx. And then we have the torsion of your curve, which uh, is introduced when you differentiate the normal. Right? So the curvature sort of just uh, describes the way that you're turning your steering wheel as you drive along the curve. And the torsion is describing sort of how much this curve is leaving the plane that approximates it. So that's, our, that's sort of the high-level story from, from Wednesday. Are there any questions left over from that lecture? Because I'm going to use it like, like for all of today and really for the rest of this course. So one more question. All right. So, of course, this being computer science class is not, oh, Leo? Yeah. 
Can you go back to the previous slide? Uh-oh. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I thought if you sum this thing, you get zero. But, yeah, but you don't. You don't. No. no. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, no yeah, problem. Yeah. Sorry.
an arbitrarily closed Bezier curve that looks a lot like that curve. Yeah? But, Um, but anyway, so yeah, so we have a strict, not, uh, that, that this is a strict containment, right? There are exist curves on the right hand side that don't exist on the left. Well, they're only approximations anyway, and maybe we're a little bit flippant about it, and we say, well, we can, I can come up with a much simpler approximation, which is if I take the curve, like this purple one here, right, then probably what we're used to from calculus class is just approximating it with a bunch of line statements. And it turns out for our usual, and we'll call this a uh, piecewise linear. Um, and 
there was this last thing called the Gauss map. Now what the Gauss map does is it takes every point on your original curve, right, that's this guy upstairs here, and it maps it to a point on the inner circle, which is just the normal of the curve. Right? So the Gauss map is just a fancy name for now for the function from curve to unit normal. Right? But the, the extra little piece of intuition we have is that really the unit normal sit on the unit circle here, right? S1 stands for unit circle. It actually is a one-dimensional object. Um, and, and that this is a function from curve to curve, yeah? So what are we gonna do? Well, based on this intuition for the Gauss map, uh, and actually I guess in my derivation here I ended up using unit tangents, but if you rotate it everything 90 degrees, nothing would change here. Uh, this, is, this is my fault. Uh, but anyway, since we're, on, uh, since we're on the 2D plane here, one nice way that we can write down the unit tangent, or the unit normal, right, they're just 90 degrees apart, is using an angle theta, right? So let's say that I have my curve, right? There's this green guy here, and I compute the tangent at this point, like that. Well, I can put just a canonical x, y axis on, on t space, and then I can say that theta of s is the angle between the unit tangent and the x axis, right? Perfectly fine, because I'm on the plane. And one thing I could do is say, okay, the unit tangent is the curve and the function of s, well, all it is is this cosine and sine of some theta, so let's write that down instead. Does that make sense? So, in that case, uh, let's differentiate the unit tangent. Hopefully we're, we're pretty good at the chain rule by now, having all at least looked at the homework. And, and what you get, well, the derivative of cosine is minus sine, derivative of sine is cosine, but uh, by the chain rule, I also have to pull out this theta prime over here, right? And one thing you do is say, well, look at this thing. Right, this thing on the right is unit length. So let's call him the, uh, the normal vectors of the curve. And what does this make this number on the left? Well, it makes it the scalar, or it makes it the curvature of our curve gamma. Yeah? Now I've hidden something from you, which is that this number can be negative. Right? The curvature that we talked about before, if we're just looking at the norm of the derivative of t, the norm tend to be positive. Yeah? So since we're on the plane, we can actually have something called the sine curvature, which we define to be this number here. So why the heck would I do that? Well, let's say that I have a closed curve, right? All, all a closed curve means is that the end is the same as the beginning. Yeah? One thing I do is measure this thing called the turning number, which is pretty simple. The turning number says how many times the curve loops around itself. Yeah? So one way to think about this, remember our Gauss map object, right? It's gonna take your curve to unit normal. And what's gonna happen is as I move around the circle, Right? Basically, all the Gauss map is doing is just making a, it, it, it's just doing the hokey pokey and turning itself around some number of times before you reach back to the beginning of the curve again. Right? So the Gauss map is moving around the circle even if your curve is making a figure eight or what have you. Yeah? And the turning, the turning number of the curve is how many times the Gauss map does this before you get back to where you started. So, how are we going to be able to recover the turning number of a curve from the curvature? Well, remember that I wrote down this little this little expression here. Right? This is the derivative of our, our angle here is equal to the scalar curvature of the curve, right? So now I'm just going to reverse what I just did and say, okay, so the change in angle here is just the integral of the sine curvature that I defined for you a couple slides ago, right? This is like kind of a boring thing I just did. I did the very first thing was I differentiated theta, and now I'm going to integrate it again. Yeah. But what did I just show? I showed that your change in angle is equal to this integrated curvature from, from between two points in time, or two points in our plane, actually, that we're looking at. Does this make sense? So if I'm circulating around a curve and I want to compute the turning, the turning numbers, yeah?
there's never there's never a point on the curve that has this this normal. And that's sort of the orientation that you walk around the curve. So your normal computer point A is more Alex, yes? Um, so I guess at this point, right, the normal should be this way. So it would have to be there are only really two possibilities for it to be. But you can see that by picking up a figure eight, you flip your orientation around when you walk around the opposite way. So your normal access points in both times that you're really close to the parallel direct that line. Hopefully I did this right. This is a figure I lifted from a paper, so I'm pretty sure it's right. Uh, <laughs>
basically the science is saying, yeah, if you think of the curvature as more or less constant, then this is the number it should be. And then usually if you take the curve and add a point, this number converges to the, the correct solution. Cool. Of course, it's sort of an interesting distinction, right? Now, I've given you two different piece nonlinear curves, but they look awfully similar. Yeah? One has two vertices, and one has one, two, three, four, five, seven vertices. Yeah? Now, our integrated curvature along the arc from this point to this point is the same on both, right? You have the same turning angle. But our interpretation is a little bit different. Right? Because what have I done here? Well, I've introduced some little straight line segments here, which now we're going to think of, because there's no turning angle at this point, as having zero curvature. Yeah, but that means that the curvature, as the turning angle of this one vertex at the top, now is distributed among a much smaller amount of space. Right? And so anyway, well, the same integrated curvature holds for both of these things. Our, our sort of approximation of what we think the curvature might be point-wise is actually different. Um, one way to think about that, as, as we sort of just mentioned, right, is that really this guy on the left might very well approximate this nice smoother arc of, of much less curvature, whereas up here we're more likely to have this very sharp curvature. Yeah. By the way, this is a, a preview of something that we'll call discrete exterior calculus in a, in a couple weeks. So basically we think of theta as an integrated version of the, uh, the differential thing that you're really trying to understand. And that uh, this, this, this piece of your curve from the midpoint to the vertex to the other midpoint is something that, that you can think of as a dual cell of this vertex, right? Namely, uh, this vertex is a zero-dimensional object, right? But the curve is one-dimensional, and this is sort of the one-dimensional dual of that vertex. We'll be able to do the same thing for uh, 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 surface approximations in, in, a, in a few weeks. So anyway, now I can prove for you guys a discrete turning angle theorem going to be like the world's easiest theorem to prove. Yeah? Namely, let's say that I want to integrate curvature along my curve. Well, that's the same thing as integrating it along each segment. Yeah? So we know how to integrate curvature along each segment just by definition, right? It's just the sum of the turning angles, which we already decided was 2 pi times the turning angle of the curve. Or, or the uh, turning number, I mean. Yeah? Why don't you take the midpoint to be... Um, so it turns out that the for, for, for the integrate quantity, it doesn't matter. Um, for the curvature approximation, it's sort of like, well, because what better do we have to choose? But uh, the idea is that we're going to try to avoid ever using that point-wise number. That's just the intuition that you can use. Yeah. So great. So what did we what did we just do here? Well, initially, I introduced to you guys a new viewpoint about what curvature is. Yeah, namely, curvature can be defined by looking at the change of this angle theta, right? And now I've defined for you guys at least an integrated version of curvature that preserves the turning angle theorem exactly, right? And now, if I, if I had looked at curvature from a divided differences standpoint, my construction probably would not have, have preserved this thing uh, precisely, right? This holds at every single level of granularity from my curve. Probably instead, if I used, you know, just, just the usual approximations, what would happen is as h gets small, we approach the turning angle of the curve. But here the structure holds it all still. So this is the sort of construction that we tend to like here. By the way, this isn't the only definition of the curvature of a plane here, right? So for example, on your homework, I'm gonna ask you guys, in fact, I did ask you guys to prove a slightly different fact, which is that if I write down this curvature normal, right, and I, and I walk along, I guess here I put a minus sign in front of it, if I walk along minus the curvature normal, right, and so I'm taking my curve and kind of morphing it along this direction that I've chosen, this is the direction that's going to decrease the length of the curve the most. This is because I fixed it to r point, or I fixed it to n point, right? So this is an alternative definition for the curvature of a curve. Well, it's pretty easy to write down, and in fact, you will also do this in your homework, it's easy to write down an expression for the length of the piecewise linear curve, right? Length of a piecewise linear curve is just the sum of the length of the little segments. And this is a function we can differentiate with respect to uh, the positions of all of the little vertices along the curve. And what are we going to get? Well, we'll get that the gradient of light, right? That's this number that we really care about. It's equal to 2 times the normal to the curve, just some reasonable definition of normal, times sine of the turning angle divided by 2. Well, this is a little bit scary, right? Because initially, I said, you know, the structure that I wanted to preserve was this turning number theorem, right? And 
for my definition of integrated curvature at theta, the turning numbers here hold exactly. But now I look at this alternative definition of curvature. It's the thing that increases or decreases the length the most. It's the curvature normal. Right? But what is the norm for the curvature normal? It's not theta, it's sine of theta over 2 times 2. Yeah? So this thing does not preserve the turning angle, but it preserves a different property, namely that it decreases the length the most when you when you walk along this direction. Um, so the yeah. walking along this direction you mean change the curve. Yeah. Displace the vertices of the curve in the direction specified by this particular vector. Exactly. Yeah. So you think of it as like
curve that loses the gamma. Right? And then we can apply our favorite trick, but now to the normal instead of the binormal, and say, well, we got two perpendicular objects, so we can change the cross product, and now we have uh, and now we have now we have normal. Right? So anyway, these guys define a discrete for an A frame. Uh, one thing you could do then is say, okay, to go from one tangent to the next, you just have some rotation matrix. And and the way to understand that the uh, the bond and torsion angle of the curve, which is both awfully similar to curvature and torsion, uh, come from looking at the associated rotation angles of these two rotation matrices. Makes sense. And I'm not going to discuss their applications because this is not something I'm too familiar with. Um, but they do show how you can use this to, uh, I guess, take a scan of some different uh, biological objects and then be able to at least find this particular structure called a pink alpha helix, which apparently has um, curvature that's sort of easy to, to characterize from this discrete shape. Um, some other folks have actually extended this work. Uh, one thing you do is say, okay, we have, we have tangent normal binormal. Uh, we can come up with some rotation matrix that's going to take me from one in a frame to the next. Um, and, and these folks sort of look at this rotation matrix R and understand the structure that's in it and how it's related a little bit more carefully to the, the continuous from A frame. And the kind of cool thing this paper does, which is, like I said, again, a little bit up, outside the scope of what we can do today, is they actually show that in the continuum limit, this discrete construction here holds for curves that are not you can actually find the Frenet frame of like a fractal object with these really big features. And apparently this one works. So anyway, fun fact of the day. I encourage you to read this paper and if uh, somebody wants to implement this as a final project and tell us what the heck it's saying about life, it'd be very interesting to me because I, 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 I couldn't follow this one other time. <laughs> Unfortunately, actually understanding this Frenet frame in a discrete context can be quite difficult. And now, why is that? Well, what happens in the Frenet frame when, when the curvature is zero? Well, all of a sudden, a lot of things start to break. Right? Now, by the way, what is a curve with zero curvature and for now zero torsion? Yeah, it's a straight line. Yeah? And we better understand straight lines if we're going to understand the theory of curves, because they show up a lot in life. Yeah? And even if you don't have an exact straight line, you'll probably see something that's pretty darn flat. And what will tend to happen is this broken behavior will become more and more prominent until you get to the exact straight line. Yeah? But, but, but what's the problem here? Well, how did we define the unit normal to our curve? Well, we took this function, which is the unit tangent, which is perfectly well defined, right? Straight line, pretty easy to write down the tangent. But what's the derivative of the tangent along the straight line? Sorry, I'm not moving on to some of this. along a straight line, the tangent's not changing, yeah? So it's got zero derivative. But how did I define the normal to my curve? Well, I said you take the unit tangent, you differentiate it along the curve, and then you get rid of this curvature object, and now you got the normal. But I can't divide something by its length when it's got no length, right? So what is the Frenet frame along a straight line? And the answer is, who the heck knows? You can define whatever you want, and as long as the unit tangent is parallel to the curve, life is good. Yeah? But from a computational standpoint, this isn't so great. Namely, at every joint of my straight line curve, I could just, for the heck of it, choose a different normal and binormal and have them have nothing to do with one another. Right? And then how am I supposed to use this to understand the structure of my curve? The answer is, well, probably not very well. So, unfortunately for us, it's, uh, we do want to study the structure of curves. And one sample application that actually was uh, recently appeared in the Shigraph conference uh, was the idea of understanding a discrete elastic rod. Now, what are elastic rods? Unfortunately, I meant to bring an extra shoelace today, and I forgot. Um, I think I can have your shoes, but you don't need to do that. Uh, I wonder if it's actually a replication of the one. So let's say that I take these strings, and I rotate them enough times. This is particularly complicated. Simulated in physics, 
then I better get that behavior right. Right? Can we think of why people might want to simulate teams of three in the real world? Well, you've got several thousand attached to the top of your head, and certainly in computer graphics, we want to have characters with real elastic hair. Yeah? Um, yeah, the, the, the paper also motivates a few other examples as well. Right? By the way, this, this physical phenomenon apparently is called what, the plectrum beam or something. This is, uh, but anyway, it's a very, very specific phenomenon that we'd like to replicate. Now let's say that I represented this curve here. This is a piecewise linear object, right? So we're doing all this differential geometry. We kind of hope that we should be able to do that. Is that enough information to replicate this sort of curve behavior here? The answer is no. In particular, what did I do to get this uh, structure here? Well, again, I held one end fixed, and then I twisted the other end. Yeah? Does anything about a piecewise linear curve uh, encode that type of twist information? The answer is no. The, the twist information has got to be another, another number that I'm going to have to twist here, which is going to be one. So really what this paper is all about is going to be how do you represent objects like this and then do simulations of them. And actually, they were able to get some pretty cool results. Certain configurations over others. Yeah. 
and we've got to expose that. One way to do that is to simply write down a potential energy. Right? You've probably seen this in high school physics class, right? When you roll a ball down a hill, it wants to go downstairs, and the reason for that, or one, one way to think about that, is it wants to decrease its uh, gravitational potential. Right? Turns out that, 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 that things like rocks can have potentials too. Right? For example, we have this thing called the bending energy. And what does the bending energy punish? It punishes curvature. Right? Funny thing. It turns out that these are all physical objects, by the way. This isn't something that this paper invented. Um, so what we can do is, and, and capital gamma will stand for our curvature, we can move along the entire curve and just integrate curvature space. By the way, if you're not, I know we're CS people, we don't like this, this integral sign. If you don't like it, you can replace it with sum. Right? All we're doing is that as you going along the curve, we're going to sum up the amount of curvature that we see. So what is the bending energy of a, uh, just a straight, Curve segment? Zero, thank you. And uh, of a circle of radius one? Uh, no, no, no. Okay, but uh, these things you can compute in closed form, and, and, and in general we can do this. Now remember that we have this new frame, right? We're not using it for an A frame anymore, we're using this adapted material frame, M1 and M2. And of course, we really like to be able to write everything in terms of these sorts of numbers. So, how can we do that? Well, let's say that we have the curvature normal here, Fn. By definition, this is the derivative of the tangent. Right? By the way, I think I've swapped a couple times between little c and capital C in this lecture, but they're the same topic. Um, well, remember that c, m1, and m2 form a basis for a three phase. Yeah? So how can I reconstruct things from a basis? Well, there are, in fact, there are more than normal bases. So I can take the dot product of c prime of c, multiplied by c here, this is projection on the t. Take the dot product of m1, multiplied by m1, projection on this, on this guy, and take the projection on m2, right? And since these guys form a basis for three space, I haven't done anything. Is that cool? You guys understand this guy? Well, okay. Uh, how, what, who can tell me what this number is here? I'm moving on to somebody like says it out loud. <laughs> Zero, right? Again, c is a unit vector, so when so by the theorem that we so rigorously proved over here, we know that the derivative of c, inner product of c, is equal to zero. Yeah? So yet another application of this little, this little lemma here. And finally, we're going to simply define two numbers, omega one and omega two, which are going to be the derivative of uh, or the, the derivative of c projected on the m1 and m2. So in that case, uh, now let's return back to our bending energy. What do we just show? Well, we showed that, remember, kappa squared is just the norm of this vector. Yeah. So in other words, we could also write it down here as the norm of that vector. And, and remember that m1 and m2 are orthogonal. And so the norm of a vector in an orthogonal basis is pretty easy to write down. It's just the sum of the squares. Yeah. So in other words, our final expression for the, the bending energy of our curve, omega 1 squared plus omega 2 squared integrated over the curve. Alpha is just a constant, right? It kind of describes how stiff the curve is. Cool. And remember that our curve isn't just resistant to bending it like that, but it's also resistant to twisting it, right? Again, if you go home and play with your shoelaces, you'll find that if you twist your shoelaces, it doesn't want to be twisted anymore. And then we need to be able to encode that energy as well. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to define a number called n, which is going to be m1 prime or dot m2. What does this number represent? Well, let's, let's think about this in our new adapted basis, right? So first of all, what is m1 prime dot m? Everybody, come on. Zero, because m1 is a unit vector. So m1 prime dot m has got to be zero by our favorite lemma here. So that means that m1 has sort of, uh, the, the derivative of m1 has two components. One of them is parallel to m2, and one of them is parallel to the tangent. So what this is saying is that this number m here is the amount that your material frame is changing, but only sort of in the, the component of the curve that's, that's normal to this thing, right? Namely, the component of m1 that's changing parallel to the tangent is basically the curvature of my curve, right? We've already measured that. So now we want to measure the twist, which is in, in the plane that's orthogonal to of course, you should be asking a question, which is like, okay, we have M1 and M2, why the heck did you put M2 here and M1 here, right? And the answer had better be that it doesn't matter. And indeed, you can check that pretty easily, right? So, so I went ahead and did this for you. So let's say that I've taken the derivative of M1 dot M2, by the same rule, that's M1 prime dot M2 plus M1 dot M2 prime, yeah? So in other words, if I subtract off the second one, then I get to the first thing back, right? 
So what is m1.mc? Zero. You guys will notice that any time I ask a question in the class, the, the, the answer is either zero or one. Um, okay, so since this number is zero, that means that these two guys are just minus one another. Okay? But notice that in our, our switching energy here, we're squaring m anyway, so it doesn't really matter which of these two things we choose. Cool? So what's going to be the, the, the basic sort of simulation idea of this paper is that we have this trade-off between bending and twisting and so on. Right? There's these two potential energies, and we're just going to we're gonna put our curve in some weird, bent up, you know, twisting configuration and let it go. And then these two energies are going to fight in a way to make the curve want to untwist itself and so on. So this literally can fit into your head. Cool? Um, yeah, so anyways, uh, if we swap M1 and M2, it doesn't affect the twisting energy, so, you know, who cares how we define that? Now, we, yes? Uh, are these actually just open and left? I guess the M1 and M2 side? They're somewhat arbitrary.
now they're switching around because my curve is, is shaped this way, right? And the way that they switch around is exactly the vicious thing. And in fact, it has this really nice property, which is that if you look at the curvature binormal of my curve, so the thing I can define, right? I take binormal, I scale by curvature of the curve, then you can get an ODE, right? This differential equation for how to compute this, uh, this vicious frame by saying that the derivative of each of these objects, right? So you and me is going to be this nice relaxed vicious frame. It's just parallel to take the cross product of the frame itself with this thing called the Darboux vector. Okay? Unfortunately, we don't have enough time in class to derive this back. Maybe we can do it later on. Um, or you can take a look at the paper. It's actually it's, it's, it's straightforward. So in the end, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to have a curve, right? What if it's just a curve with these little piecewise linear segments on it, right? And we're going to have a way to compute this basic u comma b at every segment of the curve. And then we'll simply have an angle theta, which rotates you from u and b to the twisted uh, version of the curve, right? So what theta is going to represent is how much of this I've done relative to the most relaxed version of the curve. Right, you guys can notice that really our, our choice of the vicious frame was awesome for doing the type of simulation we care about, right? Because all we, all we need now is this one angle theta, which tells us how much we twisted this thing. And that's going to be the twisting energy. But it's kind of easy to see that the twisting energy is just this, the, uh, the derivative of this theta angle. But we notice that it's a theta prime, again, for our initial choice of u and v. Cool. So what are our degrees of freedom as we do the simulation? Well, it's the shape of the curve, right? Just a bunch of joints, so piece by linear thing. And now just one more number, which is this number theta, right? Namely, this uv frame is just something that is associated with the geometry of the curve. It has nothing to do with my simulation. Cool. So let's let's do the uh, the discrete version. Of this. By the way, this is called a uh, Kirchhoff rod, I think. I just came out of the basement. The same the same guy as the circuit. But anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna have a curve with a bunch of x's, which are gonna be the uh, the joints of the curve, right? And we'll associate with this. Remember, what's the very first thing you can do with like any discrete piecewise linear curve is compute the tangents, right? All they are is parallel to the edges. By the way, they have this nice notation in this paper where anytime you see an index that's down, that index is gonna live on the vertices of the curve. Anytime you see an index that's up, it'll live on the edges, right? So tangents live on the edges, so they're like e one. And it's pretty easy to see what to do. You just subtract, divide by the norm, you get the unit tangent. Cool? <coughs> now, these guys, and this is yet another aspect of this that we won't be able to litigate it, which is really nice. Um, just to find yet another curvature for this curve, which has to do with the type of structure that you want to preserve in the vicious frame. And in their case, they find that if you take the turning angle, I guess it's just, I switch you guys from theta to phi because we have theta for this fifth thing. Um, then, then what they really want is two times tangent of phi divided by two. Uh, can anybody guess what tangent looks like if phi gets small? Judging from the pattern that we already had, right? Remember the reason that sort of theta and then two sine of theta over two was sort of okay in the limit is because sine looks more or less like the identity when when x when the angle is very small. Well, tangent has the same property, so all of these things converge to the same sort of symmetry. Um, and what they can do is define this curvature binormal, and the nice thing if you work out your algebra is you start with this definition of curvature and multiply it by the discrete binormal, which is the same binormal that we defined for that Bernay frame paper. Remember, just cross product of two adjacent uh, tangent vectors. By the way, it's going to live on vertices or edges. Zero curvature, you, it certainly should be zero. True, but then you also, if you do 
don't have a binomial relationship. You don't, but you have a curvature binomial relationship. Right? Because all this is the object that we care about. Right? And if we, we have a traditional thing in the denominator here, it, we're not divided by zero anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Yeah. Cool. And what happens to our bending energy? Well, this is where we have to cheat a little bit, right? We really like to be able to interpret all of these objects as sort of integrated quantities. But every once in a while, we'll have a number that's integrated over an edge, but really we need it on a vertex or vice versa. And this is one example of that. We remember that our curvature binomial lives on the vertices. Yeah, cross products to adjacent uh, tangent things. Well, so what can we do? Well, we can divide it by the length. That gives us sort of a pointwise estimation. And then we can multiply it by a different length to get us to where we want. And then what comes out is an expression here. Um, what's another way of thinking about this? Uh, right, so, so I guess the, the demanding energy is really the square of the norm of this thing. Right, and when you, when you square stuff, then, then you can't you can't take the integral of a function and then square it and expect it to be the same as the square of the, that's rather unique, that brings it square. If I have f of x, and I take the integral of f of x, and then I square that number, that is not the same as taking f of x, squaring it, and then taking its integral, yeah? So if I want to integrate uh, the norm of this curvature binomial thing along the curve, right, what is the norm of kappa b, by the way? So what am I going to have to do? Well, I can take this thing and make it into a pointwise quantity by, divide, by dividing by the length of, of this little segment here. Okay? And then now I can square this number because this is some approximation of our curvature function. Notice I use the word approximation. I can no longer call this thing you know, discrete differential geometry in a very strict sense. But anyway, so I have this pointwise quantity, I square it, and now I'm going to multiply by the length of the segment again to integrate that square number. Okay, obviously these L's cancel in a nice way, and this is what comes out. This is an approximation of the bending of an energy, the bending energy of the curve. This is not some like God-given number that, that is associated with a discrete object. Do you guys see the difference here a little bit? Cool. I don't know, this is well, this is the, the kind of the hairy part of the paper. Let me look at that. Mm, maybe we don't need to explain how this works. That's kind of the point, right? Yeah. Okay. So finally, uh, our basic frame, we're going to define this object called discrete parallel transport. Parallel transport basically, and we'll, we'll go into what this means in more detail when we talk about curvature, but one way to think about it is sort of, if I take a vector on, at, at point zero on the curve, and I'm going to drag it along that curve, right? Now because the orientation of the curve has changed, it might be, for example, like let's say that I have a normal vector, and I want to keep that vector perpendicular to my curve at all times. But I'm going to have to do something to change it as my curve, uh, you know, changes its handle, right? Because it'll be no longer normal when my, when my curve is made of, you know, I've got a curve. So there's this operator called parallel transport that says, I'm going to do this in sort of the most relaxed way possible. And the nice thing is that in the discrete case, parallel transport is much easier to understand than in the continuous one. So in particular, uh, let's say I want to define a nice relaxed way to take a, you know, a three frame segment of the curve and make it a three frame on the next line segment of this, this sequence linear object. Well, I can define an object, uh, 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 an operator P, right? P is just an orthogonal matrix that's going to take, uh, you know, the tangent on this one, the tangent on that one, and the two uh, orthogonal vectors through the tangent on one segment and bring them to two orthogonal vectors on the other segment. Did the idea of P make sense? We're just helping make the frame on two adjacent segments talk to each other. And how are we going to do that? Well, probably if we do parallel transport, and I won't, <laughs> we're low on time, so we won't motivate this for time. If we take this previous tangent, and I map it under P to the next segment, I better get the next tangent back out. Yeah. Now, remember, so P is going to live on, you know, it's going to take you from this segment to that segment. So if I take the binormal, which is associated with these two segments simultaneously, it's going to be the cross product of the two adjacent uh, uh, intersections, right? That's this thing here. Now, well, what do you think that our, our transport operator should do with the binomial? Well, it's associated with both of the segments that are adjacent to one another. So the most reasonable thing to do is just leave it alone. Okay? And now since, since P is an orthogonal matrix, specifying two vectors is enough, right? The third one's not discrete, so it's just the adjacent. So 
So again, how do we define our business frame? You guys should all be paying attention because you have your homework. There's a case of uh, <laughs> we take all these views, which are associated with segments, and I'm just going to apply this parallel transport operator to get to give me some one discrete basic frame domain. Very simple to see. By the way, in your homework, if you find me using a linear solve, it's fine. You don't need it because it's one of our homework Um Great. So anyway, how are we going to Now I have a complete picture, right? We have a discrete curve, which is composed of a bunch of these little linear segments, right? On each edge of this curve, we're going to have this, the, these three orthonormal vectors, right? The tangents, and then U and V, right? And then we'll associate also on each of these edges this angle, which is going to tell you how much the edge is twisted away from the most relaxed curve. So then with that, and with those energies, we can do physics. Unfortunately, this is a geometry class, so we're going to omit it. But um, you guys can take a look at this paper. It's worth reading. They do some really interesting stuff. To be able to do pretty fast, um, not quite real-time simulation in this paper, but then they extend it in another one called the Steve Dixon Center. Right? I mentioned this, I think, in the first lecture of this class. Um, well, what you can do is you take a jar of honey, you flip it upside down, and you turn on a treadmill, of all things. And you look as the, uh, the honey drops onto the treadmill. Right? It kind of looks like a thread. And indeed, there's this really bizarre physical phenomenon that happens where, for a while, that thread of honey behaves like a piece of string, and then eventually it bleeds out and behaves like a liquid. Right? So one thing we can do is take advantage of that string behavior and look at this paper we just talked about, right? these, these elastic rods, and try to sit somewhere halfway in between uh, the idea of simulating an elastic rod and then eventually simulating a fluid. And that's what they do in addition to, uh, I think, doing some of this improvement to the, the original elastic and indeed, they uh, announced that they have the first numerical fluid mechanical sewing machine. Um, a sewing machine, apparently, in this field being this, uh, this object with a, uh, a, a jar of honey and a treadmill. If, an, if anybody can explain to me what the relationship between that and the sewing machines, I don't know about my education. So anyway, what are the morals, what are the takeaways for today's lecture? Well, for one thing, we have one discrete curve, right? This bunch of sequence linear segments. And I've given you three different ways to define the curvature with an integrated version thereof. Right? We can have the spreading angle theta. Right? We can have this thing, which is the gradient of arc length, which is 2 sine of theta over 2. Or we can have this other object, which is associated with parallel transport along the curve, which is 2 tangent of theta over 2. And these are three different numbers. Right? If I give you the turning angle of the curve, I will get three different curvatures depending on which formula I use. Now in the limit, as I get tons and tons and tons of segments, right, the individual turning angles get very small, and in that regime, these are all more or less the same number. But if I'm doing simulation or some sort of uh, calculus on curves that are composed of larger pieces, then the decision of which of these three guys to use is going to make a big difference. And it'll depend on the application, whether you're simulating air or shortening curves for some reason or, or what have you. Um, another takeaway that you should get is that not always will the differential structure that we're used to from, from classical geometry be the one that we really want to use. In particular, this Frenet frame that we all know and love and spend like the first four weeks of classical differential geometry class on, it turns out to be completely impractical for, for most of our discrete purposes. So we tend to not use it. So it's an easy theoretical object that is difficult to apply. Um, also, that taking a physical problem and writing it in the proper coordinates and the proper degrees of freedom is really important. Right? That we were able to take the bending energy and the twisting energy of the discrete curve, and once we wrote it in this nice bishop basis, all we needed for our degrees of freedom are to add one additional number to the, to the discrete curve we already had, right? this theta. Right? If we tried to do this in XYZ, we'd have to keep track of some really bizarre expressions for twist that have very little to do with the curve itself. So anyway, uh, that sort of begins and ends our, our discussion of discrete curves. There actually is a lot more literature there, both in simulation 
and in understanding structures like proteins, right, which has this nice discrete curve structure. But uh, most of the interest in discrete differential geometry happens on structures, just like the bundle did. So the next lecture, uh, Adrian will talk, the next two lectures, in fact, will cover the theory of surfaces, and then we'll talk about how to obtain them, do differential geometry on them, and so on. So I guess we're, uh, we're done for